So 
first Sunday of Advent, and um, we'll ask during the announcements, but we'll be asking if anybody wants to volunteer to do the following week, so please think about that. Today's candle is hope. People hope for many things. We hope for the desires of our heart, for higher positions in life, and for the best for the future. Many of these hopes are practical. These hopes will bring about more opportunities and better circumstances. Yet Christians share a deeper hope, a hope that touches the deepest longings of the human soul. Theologically, we hope for redemption. We know the world around us is not at its best. Between the evils of the world and the sorrows of life, there is something within us that hopes for something truer, purer, something with sheer goodness. We all hope for the abundant life. Today marks the first week of Advent, a season recognized by the church around the world as a time to prepare our hearts and lives to welcoming the coming of Jesus Christ at Christmas. We track this season by engaging in several rhythms, one of them being to light the candles, one for each week leading up to Christmas Day. Today we light the first candle, traditionally called the Candle of Hope. With this candle we symbolize the hope we have through Christ, hope for redemption, hope for light in the darkness of this world, hope for heaven to touch earth and meet us in the midst of our mess and brokenness. The church discusses John the Baptist during Advent as a voice one calling in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. From Isaiah, Isaiah 43, see also John 123 and Mark 13. This herald of hope points to the majesty, honor, and kingship of Christ. Make way for the true king in your hearts. Clear the path. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Hebrews 12, 1. Yet not only this, we were also beckoned to cast our hope upon Christ as life giver, sustainer, provider, and agent of transformation. Put your hope in Christ again today. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the hope you brought to us at Christmas. Shine your hope in us, in our homes, in our communities, and around the world. When all seems hopeless, Holy Spirit, teach us to hope in Christ. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to page 168, both verses.
worship service here at New Life Church in Berlin, Florida, in the St. Francis Chapel. We're glad that you're here, and we're glad that you are watching us online. I would uh, remind you that uh, we're going to be having a Christmas Eve service here in the chapel at 6.30 on Christmas Eve. Uh, did you mention you're looking for... I did Jesus. mention that. All right. Today we are celebrating uh, Holy Communion, and uh, I would remind you that you do not have to be a member of the church. Uh, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came to save us from our sins. If there's no other announcements, let us stand for our glory of of our 
our faith. So we do come to worship you with our gifts, our time, and our talents. We lift up Candy and lift up uh, Gary in New York who have asked for special prayer. We also lift up uh, those that are in sickness and those that are in sorrow, those that are free, and those that have recently lost loved ones. We lift up our first responders in our world, our doctors and our nurses and their staff. This day we continue to lift up Israel and her soldiers. We also lift up our own military, our young men and women who are sacrificing their life for our freedom. We lift up and pray for all the Christian churches throughout the world and their pastors. And we lift up our own church that we would be able to spread the gospel and feed those that are spiritually hungry. For it is in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we do pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever.
As you can see, we are still getting our act together. But it's good that we have wives that tell us everything to do. I think the only, it's not too dark for me, the only disadvantage is we might have more people sleeping. It's okay if you sleep, and it's okay if you snore a little bit, but don't drool. <laughs> Got everything? Sit down, don't do anything. <laughs> the title of my sermon this morning is Be Prepared with Hope. You should have preached that last Sunday, this Sunday. The Lord has uh, some ways of keeping us humble. Let me say at the outset that having hope without preparation is waiting for the rabbit to pop out of the magician's hat. My definition of hope is waiting anxiously for something to happen 
or for something not to happen. We have two scriptures this morning, both out of the book of Luke, the third chapter, beginning with uh, verse 4 through verse 6, and it comes to us from the Old Testament, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Of course, we know that's talking about John the Baptist. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God's works. And then over in way up in the 22nd chapter of Luke, we read verses 34 through 38. A scripture that may not seem appropriate for Advent, but hopefully it will in just a few moments. And this is Jesus talking to Peter. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not throw this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, did you lack anything? That was at the beginning of the ministry with Jesus and his disciples. Then he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he, if he has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written unto you and may be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me in having an end. A term that I have used throughout my life or what I call, and I know that my wife gets a little tired of hearing about it, but I call it the five P's. Prior planning prevents poor performance. In the Christian calendar, this is the first Sunday of Advent. It's a time set aside and we put the emphasis upon hope and to prepare and to be ready for hope. In order to practice hope, there must be preparation, there must be planning, and there must be programming our faith. We know that the entrance of Jesus into this world was predicted, it was prophesied, and the good news is being fulfilled, and what has not already happened will soon transpire. We know that the first coming of Christ was prepared by God himself with the hope that all of humanity would accept and trust in him for their eternal life. Eternal life if we submit, if we confess, and if we repent of our sins. Christ coming into this physical world was all planned and all prepared even down to the geographical location of his birth and all the surrounding circumstances that made this event possible. Here we have Mary, not years out of her teenage life, whose DNA can be tracked all the way back to King David. It's interesting to note that Mary is the only female in the entire Bible where we know her heritage, where we know her lineage. And that was done for a purpose because today we can trace Mary's lineage all the way back beyond David, which the book of Isaiah tells us that the Lord will come through the house of David. Well, she's nine months pregnant, 
pregnant. Pregnant. Did you hear me say pregnant? Now I looked at the map of that time. And it's about 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. If you could go 60 miles an hour as the crow flies, you could be there in an hour and a half. Now, I also figured, and I sat down with my yellow pad and pencil and what little I know about arithmetic, and uh, figured out that if you could walk three miles an hour and did that for 10 hours a day, it would take about six days to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And when you got there, there was no Holiday Inn, no Holiday Express, because there was no internet to call ahead and make reservations. There was no iPhones, no text. There was not even mail that you could make reservations. I don't know if Joseph and Mary knew exactly when their little baby was going to be brought into the world. But I do know this, that it was a dreaded trip that they were about to make. Not one that was voluntary, but one that was commanded by the government. And they had to do that in order to go and pay their taxes. They were paying their taxes to a corrupt, mean, wicked, evil, and a man that had absolutely no compassion, the king. And it had to be made. One might think that the king would send out word and say, if you are nine months pregnant, you do not have to come to Bethlehem to directly pay your taxes, but you know, one of the spouses could, and that is that Joseph could go and leave Mary behind. But no, it was demanded by law that she go even at nine months pregnant. Of course, we know the rest of the story. The birth became not dreaded, but eventually became celebrated right up to this day. For unto us is born a king. First this morning, the world is preparing the season with secular hope, with worldly hope, with carnal hope. I'm starting to wonder why does Lowe's and Walmart even take down their Christmas displays? <laughs> why don't they just leave them up because a couple of days after Christmas, you know they're going to start talking about it. You listen to it on the radio and television the day after Christmas, only 364 more days before Christmas. Well, we've had Black Friday and now we've added Cyber Monday. How long before Frantic Friday? <laughs> the Christian faith is the only religion and the only faith that shares its holy days with the rest of the world. We share Christmas, we share Easter, and we've seen what the world does with those holy days. If we Christians were able, which I doubt we could, if we were able to all get together and we decided and we made the decision that we were no longer going to celebrate Christmas and we were just going to wipe it off the calendar and we would do that no more. Do you know the first ones to complain? It would not be the church. It would not be the pastors. I tell you, the first ones to complain if we called off Christmas, it would be Amazon and UPS. I knew something was going to happen at our house one day, and I didn't know when. I didn't know if I was going to be there. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I was sitting on the front porch, and, and I was uh, studying for uh, a sermon, and I looked up, and at the end of my driveway was a UPS truck. Well, that's not uncommon at our house. If a UPS truck goes by our house without stopping, I know he's lost. 
and sooner or later he will come back. But at the very same time, a UPS truck pulled up in front of our driveway and right behind him, a FedEx truck <laughs> pulled up and stopped. And I thought, are we gonna have a fight? Is there gonna be a riot here? No, they seemed to be friends like this was not unusual to happen. And they talked and laughed with each other all the way up to my front steps when both of them dropped off a package. The world celebrates our holy days and they prepare for it. How long do we prepare to come to a worship service? Well, some of the best Christians plan Saturday night. Are we going to church in the morning, honey? Well, I don't know, it depends how I feel. And what does the weather report say? Is it gonna rain? Secondly, God has prepared in hopes that we see his truth and his prophecy. The word prophecy simply means truth. So often we think that prophecy only talks about the future. But true prophecy talks about the past, the present, and the future. I went through my concordance and went through some other material that I have, and I counted about, and don't quote me on this, but I counted around 315 scriptures where the coming of Jesus was told. And now I will read all 351 of those to you. What I've done is go through this list. And uh, it's all typed up. And I have underlined the uh, prophecies of the coming of Jesus that take no faith. That you don't have to be religious. You don't have to be a Christian. And the scriptures that I'll share with you are just plain, as Jack Webb said, just the facts, ma'am. The Lamb of God was promised way back in the book of Genesis. It was fulfilled and called, and Jesus was called the Lamb of God up in the New Testament in John. The Messiah was prophesied, that is Jesus, to come before Judah lost identity, that is Israel, Judea. And he did come, and we know that not long after Jesus, and after he was dead, buried, and resurrected, that the nation of Israel was no longer, and it was taken over by barbarians, and was not reestablished as a nation. Until when? 1947. And now we see what's going on in that part of the world. But the Bible tells us that when nation, when Israel reforms as a nation, that it will not be too many generations. In the Old Testament, still in the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, we're told that when the Messiah comes and when he's persecuted and when he's put on the cross, that he will not have a bone broken in his body. That was unusual. The bones of those crucified were always broken. But we know that even after all the torture that Jesus went through, not a bone was broken. We're told back in Leviticus that the leper cleansed and was made whole again. And here again, these are all documented events, not by the church but by the world itself. Also in Numbers, it talks about not a bone would be broken. And I'm skipping over scripture after scripture that you would have to be versed in bibliology. We're told that the Messiah would come from David's seed. And we know that that came true up in Matthew. We know that he was to rise from the dead and that's in the book of Psalms. We know that the resurrection was predicted. And there again, don't you know that if uh, Herod could have found a way to prove that he had not resurrected from that tomb, that it would have been front page 
news. We're told in the Old Testament that when Jesus died on the cross that there would be three hours of total darkness. We know this can be documented through the Roman Empire and the Roman Library. We're told that it was hated without a cause. We're told that they took counsel to put him to death. We're told that his best friends would turn him in, not his enemy. We're told that when he hung on the cross that his robe would be gambled on and parts of it would be gambled for, for it. We're told that there would be silence by Jesus and would not complain about what he was going through. We're told that he would teach through parables, the first one to teach and to preach in this method. We're told that as he was on the cross, which had never happened before and can be documented through the Roman library, that he would be given vinegar when he said, I'm thirsty. Could go on and on and on with over 315. God prepared the world and hopes today that we see these prophecies. No computer, we're told, can hold the odds, not 10 to 1 or a million to 1 or a billion to 1 or a trillion to 1, more than that. Thirdly, I wonder if the church and the community is in hope and is preparation beyond swapping gifts at Christmas time. Oh, make no mistake, we have Christmas trees and Hopefully, we'll have one here next year. That we have Advent wreaths, we have colored candles, we have special rituals. And make no mistake, all of these are very important as long as we accept that these rituals and these symbols are here to remind us of hope and what Christ has done for us in our lives. We're not to worship the rituals, but simply use them to help us to remember. Fourthly, is our government prepared for and with planned hope for this world? We were watching a uh, special last night on television. It was about UFOs, one of my favorite subjects. And uh, there were some scenarios and theories that there have been UFOs in our country, in our world, for eons of time, even way back in biblical times. But the governments and the government has decided that the general population could not handle it and would panic and everything would be topsy-turvy. And therefore, the government has held secrets. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't... I don't really believe personally in UFOs or in aliens, uh, and that's up to your personal belief. I don't, but I still enjoy uh, watching some of those programs. But the government, even today, we're told, is hiding things from us, from what the men saw the first time as they landed on the moon. Now. This is where it may get a little uncomfortable and debatable. If Christians and the church do not address the issues of government and society, who do you think will? What do you think would happen if all of the Christian churches in the world just ceased to exist? Where do you think the morality of our world would come from? Where do you think the ethics of our world would come from? Where do you think the definition of good and bad would come from? Do you think that the Kiwanis, the Civitans, other civic organizations would tell us what's right and wrong. Clubs 
Do you think that the media, right wing, left wing, would be there as people that tell us what to do and what not to do and what's good and what's bad? Do we think that our college and university professors with their intellectual insights and knowledge, would they be there to tell us what's right and what's wrong and what's ethical? The apostate church certainly has gone the wrong way in some ways, in some churches. There are churches now that were once stalwarts, that were once ahead of the world and giving to us the gospel and telling us what's right, what's wrong, what's ethical. What would Jesus do in this circumstance? Now churches have become anti-God, but yet still carry the banner and still call themselves Christians. You've heard me say it a hundred times before, that the church, the denomination that I served for 40 plus years, is now accepting homosexuality as normal and electing bishops who are lesbians marrying the same sex and threatening local pastors if you do not marry and perform that service that you can lose your ordination. I am so glad that I'm retired and that I can tell those bishops, well, I won't tell you what I can tell them, <laughs> but you know it ain't nice. <laughs> the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. I'm not leaving anybody alone. I, last week, I looked up. I just wanted to know what the Central Intelligence Agency is and, and why it is. And because I hear all of the news about the CIA and the FBI, and I want to know why they were formed. I know why the church was formed. It was, was to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was to uphold the laws in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So why was the Central Intelligence Agency formed? It was formed for only one reason. Only one reason. And that was to gather information about any threat that would be a threat to national security. It was formed the day after Pearl Harbor. And that was a surprise attack. Well, we've learned through history it was not a surprise that there were many organizations, there were many people in the government that knew about the attack on Pearl Harbor. But the job of the CIA was to warn its people. Well, they have failed, haven't they? Do you remember 9-11? I do. I was in a pastor's meeting. It was so important I can't even remember what we were talking about. But I remember it was important enough that somebody walked in the room and said, some airplanes have just crashed into the Twin Towers. And I got up and left, and the superintendent said, where do you think you're going? I said, I'm going home, going back to my church. I don't know what's going to happen in the next few minutes. If two airplanes, and now we learn of a third that's crashed into the Pentagon, what's next? Don't you think that I ought to be back with my people? At that, the superintendent dismissed all of us. And we called for a special service that evening. And I did not get back from Lakeland. Must have been lunchtime. Told my secretary, told my minister of music, some other leaders in the church, they were having a service here tonight. And they said, you won't have 10 people there. I said, don't make any difference. We're going to do it. We had standing room only, the balcony was full, and people were standing outside. You know, when the government fails, 
it seems like that's when we people begin to go back and visit hope. This, along with others, has been well documented by nonpartisan investigators. I won't take time to address the political side of the absence of hope that our world is in. I did another interesting study, and, and I thought, you know, things could, got, could not get worse, and this world is in a mess, and you listen to the news, and you read about the news. And the other day, I had an opportunity to listen, or really to read, a transcript from a news reporter in the 1950s. You know, if you didn't know that it was from the 1950s, you could swear up and down that it was current. Things have not changed in our world, and things will not change. And I don't mean to be a pessimist, but we are supposed to be a people of hope, a people that see goodness beyond what we see going on around us. Fifthly, are we prepared? The Boy Scouts motto, and on the front of your bulletin, and uh, I don't know if you can see it online or not, but it has the old Boy Scout emblem. Be prepared. Have we become more anxious and concerned about whether UPS and FedEx will deliver on time than we are about truly celebrating <coughs> that Christ will return in the form of a rapture? more concerned and spend little time hoping that all of our spiritual affairs are in order and if we were to die before we go to sleep tonight that all would be well with our soul are we more concerned about whether or not our home insurance premium is paid up than we are about the plan of assurance for our soul i hope I hope that all of us have done that. And finally, please allow me to share some of my personal hopes. These are personal. You've heard the gospel. Now, these are personal. I hope for our country in these perilous times. I hope that our country that was once known and accepted as a Christian nation, only to have government officials, including presidents, say with some giddy pride, we're no longer a Christian nation. I have hope that there will be a turnaround in diplomacy and ambassadorships, that we will go back to walking softly and carrying a big stick, and that we will respond to events that are non-Christian as God commanded the Israelites when their nation was being threatened. And he didn't say, call a meeting or see if you can go and have negotiations. Well, we see Israel. They're certainly responding. But you know, they're responding, but not without criticism from our own country. And there are those in our own country who are beginning to carry pickets and beginning to Right, and rooting for Hamas. Do you know Hamas? Do you know that they're the ones that cut off babies' heads and watch their parents make them watch? Do you know that they have absolutely no respect for humanity? That as an infidel, their success is when you die? Well, that's bad. But now we have college students that really couldn't find their ways out of a paper bag 
that are rioting and rooting for Hamas and the Palestinians. I have hoped that the church listen to this. I have hope that our church will address those brats in our Ivy League universities who picket for Hamas, claiming that Palestine should have their land returned. You know, it's obvious that those students have, must have skipped history class. Palestine's never had a land. <laughs> There's never been geographical borders. But you know the old gaslight theory, if you tell a lie enough times, people will begin to believe it. And now you ask any college student, any university professor, do you think we ought to give Palestine back their land? And they would say, yes, of course, that's the fair thing to do. Well, just exactly where is that land? Oh, history, those spoiled nerds that go to these intellectual dumpsters cannot be held totally responsible as they're being fed trash from their professors who for the most part have never worked a day in their life. Their hands have never gotten dirty. Now for those of you that have been with me for several years before I retired and after my retirement, you know that Praise the Lord, I haven't always been a preacher. <laughs> and, and I think that that's my advantage, and hopefully yours too. I know what it's like to sweat. I know what it's like to go to work when the sun comes up and not stop till it goes down. And even if the sun goes down, you're not finished. You have to work through the dark. I know what it's like to not know where the next dime's coming from. that our government, I hope, would think about not sending $223 million a day to a foreign country and would take better care of our veterans. I too am a veteran. And they uh, just recently published some new benefits we have as veterans. I couldn't wait to get on the site. What's going to happen now? Well, I'm now allowed to go on a post or a base if I can prove that I'm a veteran. Well, big deal. The last time I left a post, I never wanted to go back another day in my life. <laughs> but now I have the right. But we're sending $223 million a day and Israel is hurting. God's people. And the Bible says if you turn away and aside from Israel, woe be unto you. I wish we would stop and I hope that we would stop pushing electric vehicles when the main ingredient, when the main ingredient for lithium batteries is harvested by little children slaves that work for 50 cents a day. What's a Christian thing to do? I hope none of you came here in electric vehicles today. I would hope that our Social Security that we've paid into all of our lives be removed from the general budget. Now some of you are old enough to remember when it went from designated to private or went into the general budget. <clears throat> I hope that it would be returned to a designated account. Can you imagine how rich you would be if all that money you've put into Social Security would go, have gone to a private investment? 
then I would hope, of course, you would have to change the philosophy and the politics of our country. I would hope that those that are breaking our borders, you notice I did not say crossing, those that are breaking our borders and then rewarded with instructions on how to beat the system, receive unlimited health care, money in their pocket and their children with whom we see very few fathers enrolled in schools. If the church does not address this, who is? I hope that the Middle East could be at peace. I read a speech this week by Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. And, and he said this, I wish this is something I could have said, but it was him, he's smarter than me. He said that a ceasefire is not peace. You know, we're going through a temporary ceasefire. Detente is agreeing not to shoot, this is me. Detente is agreeing not to shoot. Peace is not wanting to shoot. So now we come to the most holy and most sacred moment, and that is a time of communication, conversation, and communion with the Lord. Whether you refer to it as communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, it is all the same. It's a time with hope to sit down with the Lord and share a time with him, to make a public profession, to send a message of hope to the world that Jesus has been born and Jesus is our only hope. Let's bow our heads for our prayer and consecration. Father, we now ask that these elements be blessed and that these elements enter into our physical bodies, that they would be turned into the spiritual body of us. And that as we leave this sanctuary, we would go out into the world and to serve you and your people. And that we would continue to give the world hope. In Christ's name we do pray. As I said earlier, you do not have to be a member of the church. Uh, you don't have to be a member of any church. All you have to do is, is believe, and today we are believing that Jesus is our hope. When you receive the sacrament, if you would please hold on to it, as those of you at home uh, have already secured your piece of bread and juice, and hold on to it, and then we can all receive this sacrament.
Take this now, the body of Christ, the bread of life. Take, eat. Take this, the symbol of the blood that was shed for you and shed for me. In Christ's name. Let's turn our hymnals to 193, O Come All You Faithful, just the first verse. Thank you. 